note played, every song sung, every voice that is spoken in this room. God, we're so grateful uh, that you looked at this world and said, I, I love these people and I want to send the greatest gift of all, uh, the present of the presence of Jesus in this place. And that's why we're excited about Christmas because it's not just about a baby in a manger, but it's about a baby who would grow up to be a man, would be the sacrifice for the sins of the world that would die on the cross in a sinner's place and resurrect from the dead. There is no power in death. There is no power in the grave anymore because our Redeemer and our Savior and our King beat death and beat the grave. And today we can celebrate life and we can celebrate that there is no other name above the name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. Well, if you grab your seats and go ahead and grab your Bibles this morning, and uh, we are kicking off our Christmas series today, and we are going to be in the book of Luke in the New Testament in chapter one, and then we're also going to be in Matthew chapter one, and today we're gonna view the Christmas story uh, through uh, three kind of lenses, if you will. And so we're gonna have to kind of piece this together through Luke's account and Matthew's account. So in Luke 1, we'll get to Luke 1 in verse 26 in a moment, and then kind of put your finger or a pen or something over in Matthew chapter 1 so, so that we can get over there and take a look at Joseph's account of how this whole thing went down. The last 11 days have been a whirlwind um, of obstacles in my family's life. I mean, it's just been one after another, after another, after another. Um, Thanksgiving morning, the whole thing got started when we woke up and our house was freezing and our furnace was not blowing warm air. And um, so that was not a good deal for us. You see, y'all have thick blood like molasses and I've got thin blood. Uh, because of living in the desert and so 50 degrees was parka weather for me um, and so our family woke up freezing so Joy said hey you know what we have this house that we've moved into now why don't you call the warranty company and exercise our right uh, to a home warranty so I didn't think we would actually get a hold of anybody on Thanksgiving morning but sure enough <laughs> somebody picked up the phone and they're working on Thanksgiving which I felt super bad for them honestly uh, at that moment I don't feel bad for them now because of the story I'm about to tell you uh, but at the end of the day we got a hold of them and uh, they said we're gonna go ahead and start a claim and we'll get somebody out within about 24 hours so I was like man that's cool awesome I can't even believe this whole thing got started on Thanksgiving morning so Friday comes and we you know uh, do kind of the family deal on Friday and and Friday evening rolls around and we hadn't heard from anybody, which I was like, listen, I'll give them a little grace. It was Thanksgiving when I called. Surely uh, we'll hear from somebody, maybe even tomorrow. Well, we didn't hear from anybody on Saturday. I'm sitting at my middle daughter, Kale, her soccer game, and I was on hold for 20 minutes before I actually talked to somebody from the warranty company and they pick up the phone and said, oh, Mr. Swenson, like we were best friends. Uh, hey, I'm so sorry that you hadn't heard from anybody. Let's just get you a new contractor. I said, that sounds like an excellent idea. Well, that then starts the process all over again. You're gonna hear from somebody now within 24 hours. Here is the contact that you need to call uh, for this particular company. So I just got on the ball. I'd already been burned once. Uh, and so now I call this other company uh, and they, the lady picks up the phone. I was actually surprised on Saturday. She picked up the phone and she was pretty much ticked that this company said that they could service our furnace because we're too far out of their range of servicing our particular area in Cincinnati. So I said, well, what do you want me to do? She said, you need to call the warranty company and tell them to get uh, you another contractor. So what did I do? I called the warranty company again. This is another obstacle. And so I called the warranty company and we get this rigmarole. And finally, Monday, uh, I get a new person and I call the new company and say, well, we won't be able to get somebody out uh, until later in the week. I said, listen, it's 20 degrees, okay? And my family's freezing and we've got six people in our family and little kids and this is not awesome. In the meantime, uh, I just called this other company and said, can you come out and take a look? Well, no, we can't. So I'm you know, trying to make this thing happen. And then finally, by God's grace, uh, this company called and said, we can have somebody out today. They just finished a job. If you can hurry over to your house, they'll diagnose your unit. So they get in, they diagnose the unit. And this is not awesome. I'm just telling you now, I, I get to be able to share with you all of my struggles. And so then they diagnose the unit and then it's gonna be more time 
Now we're rolling into Wednesday and Thursday of this week. Of uh, They ordered a part, didn't order a part, was gonna come out, didn't come out. Finally, Ed, who goes to our church and he uh, was our realtor, he gets on the phone and starts giving them the what for. And I had this lady call from the warranty company. I need you to know that I want, I was biting my tongue all, the whole conversation. I wanted to give her every ounce of frustration that I had. I wanted to get ugly. I wanted to lose myself with her on the phone. But listen, I was as polite as I could have been. And I was maybe just a little passive aggressive with her, uh, just a little bit. Uh, but I was giving her everything because we just met with obstacle after obstacle after obstacle. We didn't plan this. We wanted to enjoy part of our winter here. And the first 20 degree season and spell for us has been miserable. We didn't want it to end up that way, but that's kind of the way it was. Well, come to find out they're going to show up tomorrow morning between 7 30 and 8 o'clock and they're going to get this thing fixed, which I'm totally praising God for. And if they don't come, then you might not have a preacher next weekend. I'm just telling you right now. But isn't that how life happens? Uh, man, sometimes you're just going on doing your thing and then something, someone, something happens and life gets derailed. Uh, many of us have uh, bumped into obstacles in our lives. And maybe you've had a health crisis in your family or maybe you personally have had to walk through that and that's difficult to navigate. Maybe it was a financial obstacle that you're trying to get through. Uh, maybe it's relational. You're just trying to get your equilibrium back and get kind of back to normal and it's very difficult uh, to get back to normal. Maybe you bumped into an, uh, an educational obstacle. You thought your career would uh, advance further than it's gone and there's this whole thing about, man, you, you need to know more and have more experience, whatever it might be. You just bumped into all these types of obstacles. We've all faced them, have we not? What's interesting about that is that that means that we're not alone in this journey. That means that this section, this section, this section, even the preacher has walked through seasons of our lives where we've bumped up into obstacles. Did you know that the first Christmas was not ideal? Did you know that the story of Christmas throughout the entire story of the very first Christmas and the birth of Christ, there was obstacle after obstacle after obstacle. I mean, literally, a teenage girl gets pregnant before marriage in their culture, major taboo. The baby was born, not in a hospital, y'all. Not even in one of those, hey, let's have a baby in my home, like an aqua birth, it wasn't that. Born in a stable, in a barn, the baby shared its first bed with a feeding trough for goats. I mean, this was less than ideal, less than perfect. And it was, I mean, I'm telling you, countless moments in the story of the birth of Christ, you see obstacle after obstacle after obstacle, moment after moment after moment, where it is setback after setback after setback. And I wanna encourage you uh, with something this morning, that it is often in the less than ideal of circumstances. It is often in the obstacles and struggles of our lives that we face where God shows up the most. I am telling you right now that in the struggles of my lives and the obstacles that I have faced in my journey of living this life of 36 years, that I can tell you as a testimony of God's faithfulness that every single struggle, every single obstacle that me or my family and extended family has faced was an opportunity for God to show up the most significantly I've ever seen him show up in my life. And what I believe God wants for you this Christmas is the same thing that he wants for me and I think he wants all of us to have a perspective shift with the obstacles that we face. You see, these are obstacles, these are setbacks, these are roadblocks and for many of us, they feel super negative, wouldn't you agree? But really, our obstacles are actually now, here's the paradigm shift, they're opportunities. What are the opportunities for? Well, Aaron, here's the first, you're saying, what are they for? Here it is. Number one, our obstacles are opportunities to worship. What God wants for you and what God wants for me in the moment of struggle, in the moment of our, another way of saying it, in our deepest moment of suffering, in the Christmas season, it has a tendency to draw these things out in our lives and these obstacles become like glaringly obvious moments. And what God wants for us this Christmas season is to flip our perspective and to see that these obstacles are now opportunities to worship. The story is found in Luke chapter 1 of the account of Mary. As she hears the news of the birth of Christ and that she was intimately going to be involved with. The scripture says in verse 26, if you're with me, go ahead and make sure you're there. It'll be on the screens for you as well. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel 
was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Right out of the gate, guys, Luke, the writer of this gospel, wants you and me to know that there are some obstacles in this story. Three real specific ones really quickly was this idea that uh, this family was from this know-nothing village or this know-nothing region called Galilee and this know-nothing town called Nazareth. This is the idea of, oh, you're from there. You're from those side of the tracks. As a matter of fact, in the Gospel of John, in verse 46, Philip is a a guy who encountered Christ, um, and he went back, he got fired up about meeting the Messiah that was told about in the Old Testament, and he goes and he grabs his brother, Nathaniel, and he says, hey, Nathaniel, we we met the Messiah, the one whom the Old Testament was uh, prophesied about. He's here, I actually saw him face to face, and he says in John 1, verse 46, can anything good come out of Nazareth? That's the perspective of Nazareth, that that's an obstacle to overcome, that can anything really positive, can anything actually of any worth and good come out of this place called Nazareth? Another obstacle was the idea that Mary was a young teenage girl, probably 13, and she was a virgin. Now, I'm a dad of two girls. I think that's awesome. I don't think that's an obstacle at all. I think that's incredible. But in this story, this is a major obstacle. The Bible says that she was betrothed. It's just a fancy word in their culture. Engagement was a two-step process. There was the first step of being betrothed, which is the concept of waiting. So she was in a season of waiting. Then there was the engagement. Then there was marriage. But at the end of the day, the betrothal was the the same as engagement. It's really ultimately the the same as marriage. They were very, very committed uh, to one another in this moment. So there's some brief observations of those obstacles. Verse uh, 28 comes out and the angel speaks to her and he said to her, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Now a reasonable response from Mary, here it is. If you saw an angel, you'd feel the same way too, by the way. She was freaked out, verse 29, but she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. So the angel shows up to a young 13-year-old girl and says, hey, what's up? You're favored, God's with you. What? Like, what, what, what is this angel's point? What's he, what's he coming to, to tell me? She didn't understand why this unbelievable moment was actually happening. And so Gabriel kind of broke it real plain for her, okay? Kind of laid it all out. And this is what he says in verse 30. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. You found favor with God, Mary. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom, and of his kingdom, there will be no end. In other words, Mary, I know this is crazy. Like, I know this sounds bananas, and I know that you're afraid, and you you don't understand, but I want you to know something. Even if you don't understand, God's still with you. God's still with you in this moment, and here's the deal. He has sovereignly selected you because he knew that you were fit for the task at hand. God knows you're ready for this. I know you don't feel ready for it, but God knows that you're you're ready for it, and you're gonna have a son, and it's not just any son. He's the, the son of God. He is holy, and his name is Jesus, and he's not just a baby, and he's going to look like a baby. He's going to act like a toddler. He'll go through the preteen stage. He'll be like a human, but, but he's the son of God, and he's going to be a king, and he's not going to be. He, he is a king, and he's establishing a rule and a reign and a kingdom that will last forever, and you're a part of that process. Now, what Mary says is the same thing every person in the room would say if you're a woman who's just got this news. She says in verse 35, how? <laughs> how? 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 How will this be since I am a virgin? Hey, Gabriel, newsflash. Virgins don't have babies. Something precedes that before they can actually conceive and, and have a baby. So, Gabe, I think you got this whole thing backwards. There's a major roadblock in the road for us. So what are we going to do? And then Gabriel says, okay, Mary, let me show you how God's going to overcome this. Verse 35, and the angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, 
the son of God. And behold, your, uh, you, uh, sorry, and behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who is called barren. You see, what, what the angel is doing in this moment is, is he's saying, Mary, listen, I know it's hard to believe. I know there's a struggle in your own heart to believe that this thing could actually happen. But what I'm telling you is that God is going to do a miracle in your life. When he says that the Holy Spirit will come upon you and overshadow you, essentially he's saying the same thing twice. And he's saying that the power of God is gonna fall on you and the power of God is gonna be deposited in you and it's going to be a seed and it's gonna be an embryo and it's gonna grow into a young baby and you're gonna have a son and it's not by some Frank, it's not by Joe, it's not by Jim. You were conceived by God and he put that in you. And the reason that is that gonna happen, Mary, is because he's, he's gonna look like a boy. He's gonna look like your kid. He's gonna look like your family and he will be. He will be a boy and he will be a man but see if a, if he was born of a man he's just like every other man but he's born of God you were conceived by the Holy Spirit he is fully God and fully man and that's the only way that God could restore the broken relationship between humanity and God himself through the sinless son of God who would be the sacrifice for sin he's saying listen he's the God man and he's going to be bare, he's going to be born in you Yeah, but this is, seems pretty impossible, God. You've, you've never really done anything like this before. To which he would, the angel would say, well, kind of. That's why he inserts in the middle of this rambling about the family member Elizabeth who was in her 90s and could not get pregnant and then by miracle, God provides a baby for them in their old age. The juxtaposition of Luke and what he does. Old lady pregnant and very, very young pregnant with two very significant children who would change the world. You have to admit that this is a lot for us to take in. Now again, the nostalgia clicks in pretty quickly. But if you allow yourself to lean in with fresh eyes, you'll realize this is a lot to take in. And for some of us who've had children in your home, it's, uh, listen, every single time Joy told me that we were going to have a baby, I was overwhelmed in different ways for different reasons. And I can't imagine what a 13-year-old girl being told, you're a virgin and that doesn't matter and that's actually the recipe, that's a key ingredient in all of this and you're gonna have a baby. I can't imagine what this little girl, uh, how she felt and we don't know how much interaction, how much time has passed throughout this interaction, but you have to think about the impact that this moment had on Mary's life. Imagine her mind. How does this, how does this change my plans with Joseph? Uh, we had a future planned. What are people going to think? I mean, I'm pregnant, and I mean, we're engaged. This is a big deal. And these are all obstacles, and they seem impossible for God to overcome. Reminds me of a story. Uh, in 1927, Charles Lindbergh was the first to fly solo from New York City to Paris. And uh, what's interesting about his story is that when he got into this plane, um, there was lots of obstacles in this plane. Um, he had no radar, no parachute, no radio, no autopilot. Uh, the windshield was actually obstructed and he flew over 33 hours straight without sleep. And he navigated the entire flight with these tiny little periscopes peering through the window that were made from his things that were in his pocket. And he navigated and flew those 33 hours safely landing in Paris. This was an impossible feat until he actually did it. You see, what's true about impossibilities is that it's only impossible until it's actually accomplished. Jesus said this in Matthew 19, 26, humanly speaking, it is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. You see, the angel knew that uh, what Mary was looking at, the obstacles that she was facing in her life, um, it looked impossible. It looked like there's no way around this. There's, there's no way out of this moment until God actually accomplishes it. And look at what the angel says to Mary in verse 37, my favorite verse in the whole story. For nothing will be impossible with God. 
nothing will be impossible with God. I want you to notice what Mary does with this news of this obstacle of, hey, we were planning one thing and then boom, we're having a baby right before we were married. And this obstacle that she was met with with her life, she used this obstacle, y'all, as an opportunity to worship God. She used this obstacle not as a moment to get worried, not as a moment to get frustrated. She had human concerns, there's no doubt about it. But she allowed the Spirit of God to speak to her and to say, nothing is impossible with God on your side. God has called you to this, and he'll help you through this. And notice what she says in verse 38. And Mary said, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. I'll carry this baby as a servant. I'm, I'm, I'm raising my hands in surrender. God, you've got this and I'll do it. And then she says my favorite line, let it be to me as according to your word. She says, I am your servant. Let it be to me according to your word. If you look later in the passage, there's this whole passage that is recorded that's called Mary's Song of Praise. And in verse 46, the scripture says, and Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. What does a magnify do? Magnifying glass. It takes something that you can't normally see and you put it over and it blows it up. And it blows it up so that you can recognize it and you can see it. And what the Bible is saying is that Mary's heart is going to magnify in the obstacle, glorify, lift high the God who gave her this obstacle. She's gonna praise God through the storm, so to speak, if you will. She says, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. You see, Mary took her obstacle, she shifted her perspective, saw it as an opportunity to worship God through the storm. I don't know what you're facing today, what you're walking through this Christmas season, but what I do know is that you can let your obstacle obstruct you, or you can let your obstacle obstruct be an opportunity to worship. It can obstruct you, stop you, leave you concrete, stepped, not moving forward, or you can allow the obstacle that you're facing in your life today, this Christmas season, to propel you into the presence of God and worship him. Reminds me of Paul and Silas. They were in prison in the book of Acts. And uh, I don't know if your situation, I've been in many situations in my life that felt like a prison, and they were chained. And Paul and Silas didn't get distracted by their, their, their current circumstances. They saw it as an opportunity that, hey, you know what? I'm in this moment. I'm in chains and I'm in prison. But God is over and by and large bigger than this moment. And so they called out to God with a, a loud voice. And they literally sung praises to God in the jail cell, guys. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 16, in verse 26, that, and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bonds, their chains were unfastened. Their worship was that powerful. Like I don't think we realize what just happened in this moment and what we're singing about and what we're singing and, and the words you're saying are falling on the ears of your heavenly father in the throne room in heaven. And all of heaven is paying attention to sunrise the moment that you begin worshiping the risen king and they're dialed in and let's see what they're doing and what they're singing. Why? Because worship is that powerful. When you and I sing praises and surrender to the God of the universe, it activates the active heart of God to step in and to break chains and to open doors that seemed impossible in our lives and, and all the obstructions and all the obstacles that we face. If you allow those things to be opportunities to worship God, then I promise you God moves into action and the chains fall, the earth shakes, his presence shows up and the doors fling open. And what God wants for us this Christmas is to not miss it and to see these obstacles that we face, like Mary saw, those things are opportunities to worship. But not only are they opportunities to worship, they're also opportunities to trust. That's a hard one. Can we be honest this morning? Because sometimes when you get met with one of the deepest struggles of your life, and you're sitting around the table eating turkey with your family, 
and you have the greatest piece of conflict and it's not over a football game, it's over real emotionally heightened things. Seems to happen all the time between Thanksgiving and the new year, does it not? Why is it that every single obstacle seems more real from Thanksgiving to the new year? I don't know why it is that way, but it is that way. And these obstacles are opportunities for you and me to trust God. That's what happened with Joseph. The Ga- A- Gabriel didn't just appear to Mary and then Joseph was left over, uh, you know, on, back off in the backwoods somewhere trying to figure this thing out. He shows up to Joseph and explains the situation to him as well. In Matthew 1, in verse 18, well, we'll get there in just a second. Let me just kind of give you some background. Joseph loved Mary a lot, like a lot. You don't get engaged with somebody that you don't love. Well, I mean, maybe you did, but I didn't. But um, he loved her a lot. And you can imagine the pain. Put yourself in his situation, men. Imagine the pain that you would feel if the woman you were engaged to came to you and said, I'm pregnant. And you know the scenario surround. She's a virgin. And it wasn't you. Imagine the real humanity in his own heart, the lack of trust that he would have with Mary. And the struggle that he would feel to follow through in this moment. But he loved her. And he had full rights now, according to their culture. He could divorce her. He actually could have killed her. Or had her killed. And the weight of this moment, he said, I love her so much. I'm not going to do anything public to publicly to shame her. But what I will do is I'll divorce her privately. And I'll just move on. That's what he wanted to do. That's what he was going to do. And he was arrested. You know, his mind just couldn't stop processing the the reality of his situation. He was laying in bed at night and he couldn't shake it. You ever had those moments? The text tells us he couldn't shake it actually in verse 20. It says in verse 20, but as he considered these things, (laughs) that's what that was. He was considering these things, considering all the stuff and the the reason to divorce her, the lack of trust, the the frustration, all the obstacles now invaded his mind and and he lost sleep over it. It was the cold sweats, guys. Maybe you find yourself in a similar position this morning, worried about providing for your family. You've been offered a promotion and you know that if you were to take it, you have to move and you know that's gonna be impacting your family. It's the middle of the school year. How's that gonna work out for you? Maybe the creditors are already calling. Maybe the arguing is at an all-time high in your home. The tension is real. I don't know what constantly keeps you up at night. I know the things that keep me up at night and I can resonate with Joseph going, man, I get it, dude. Like, I get it. This is not easy to navigate and the obstacle you're facing is literally, it's like it's got its own voice and it's yelling at you in the mirror, right? You can't shake it. Let the word of God speak to you in that situation like it did to Joseph. The latter part of verse 20 says, and he considered these things and behold, the angel appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear. What do you not want me to fear, man? I don't want you to fear to take Mary as your wife. I know you're worried about it. I know all the circumstances seem awkward surrounding it. I don't want you to be fearful of that for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. You see, the angel understood the fear of taking all of this on, taking on the responsibility of uh, of Mary. And bringing that whole situation now into his family, Joseph likely felt like what what seemed so sinful, surrounded with sin, now, honestly, understanding what would happen in their life, now what was sinful will actually become sacred. What was surely to bring shame to their family actually now brings the promised deliverer of the world that will save people from their sins. What seemed like a tarnished reputation for Mary and their family, now what's awesome is that Mary will be revered as the mother of Christ throughout history. Surely Mary will be called bad and rotten, but actually she will not. She will be called blessed and favored. You see, that's what God does with our situations is he takes the 
negative if you're a follower of Christ and the Bible tells us that he takes that which looks evil and which is bad and the, the obstacle and he leverages it for, your, for his glory and for your good and for good, the good of those around you. So what did Joseph, how did he respond to the obstacle that he faced in his life? What did he do? Joseph's response to the obstacle of his lifetime was to trust God's plan and to trust God's vision for his life and for his family. How Joseph responded to the greatest obstacle he ever faced was God, you got this. God, I, I know that you're, you've got a plan and you've got a plan for my life and you've got a plan for Mary and you've obviously got a plan for this little baby that you're bringing into the world and, and I am going to exercise my faith. I'm going to put my trust in you and what you're going to do. He had to place his faith in the reality that God knew what he was doing. The great devotional writer, Oswald Chambers wrote of this kind of faith and explained that faith is the deliberate confidence in the character of God whose ways you may not understand at the time. Can I get an amen? That's what faith is. Faith is the confidence in God's character. That he says what he said, he'll do what he'll do, and he won't leave you there to figure it out by yourself. And you're banking on God's character. And it is, it is in his character that he will fulfill that which he has started in you. Chuck Swindoll, a great pastor in Texas, he explains it this way, that faith means believing in advance what will only make sense in reverse. Who can give me a witness and testify to that reality? That when you're walking through it, you're going, oh man, I sure do hope. I sure do hope God is gonna fulfill his end of the bargain and be with me in this moment. But it's only on the other side of that obstacle that you and I can now look back on our exercised faith, our exercised trust and go, only God could have got us through that. Only God could have provided that. Only God could have stepped in through that. See, we trusted God through the obstacle and on the other side of it now, we know that was God who actually did that for us. And I understand that faith and trust are counterintuitive to the human experience. I get it. Because in order for you and me to actually le like lead out in faith and trust, we have to exercise a little bit of what we know many of us don't like to do, risk. To step out in trust, there's a risk. To step out in trust and faith, there's a, a risk involved. I'll, I'll explain it like this. Stepping out in faith or in trust is a lot like taking a road trip or flying, either one, to Disney World. See, if you fly to Disneyland, you step into this, you get excited, now it costs you a lot of money, uh, but you, you get into the airplane unless you fly one of those cheap airlines, but you can get a good deal if you go last minute, and then you, uh, you get into the airplane and you get situated, you put your bags up and you, you click that seatbelt and most of you put your earphones on and don't listen to anything that the flight attendant says because I don't do it either. And you just put those things on and you're like, yeah, if it crashes, whatever. We should all stop doing that and listen to everything that those folks have to say to us because they're trying to save our life. So anyway, uh, we get into that airplane and they explain everything and you're just waiting for your, don't peanuts taste better in the air? I literally read an article as to why. I'll talk about that in another sermon, but there's a real reason why those peanuts taste better in the air. But anyway, you get, now finally, you get onto the tarmac, you hopefully don't wait, you get into the air and honestly, in that moment, you're headed to Disney World, but here's what happens, y'all. You've put, I've put, we've put all of our trust in a pilot and a co-pilot whom we've never met. We do not know their name. We do not know their experience. We're also putting our faith and trust in that mechanic that every bolt was tightened. We're putting our faith and trust in those uh, air traffic controllers and hopefully, so there's no wreck in the air, hopefully they're not getting distracted with Candy Crush on their phone. We're putting a lot of faith and trust in that moment. Is the gas tank full? Is this pilot a rookie? I really need to make sure that we're getting this thing down. You and I are putting our faith and trust in a lot of things that we will never know and never understand the reality of. That's why many of us refuse to fly and we take the road trip to Disney World. Now, what we all know is that that's the most exhausting way to get there. But the reason we do it is because we want to be in control. 
Man, you can pull over and go get a milkshake anytime you want. Stretch your legs, drive as fast as you want, as slow as you want, pull over. You know, you can go to the rest stop, you can go over to a pilot station or whatever you're gonna do. Uh, to, you, it's all in your control. And faith and trust in God is a lot like putting our faith and trust in the pilot. You see, many of us, what we do with our lives is we feel better by our human nature to be in control of the situation, but many of us know the reality that that is no way to live, to live with our hands clenched to the steering wheel of life. It leaves us exhausted. Why? Because you and I can't see things coming. We have a limited perspective and a limited understanding. We can't see all around us. We can only see like thoroughbred horses just a few feet in front of us. But when you and I put our faith and our trust in God, that raises the altitude of our lives and he has a perspective that we don't have, but we have to put our trust in him like we put our trust in the pilot as we're going to Orlando. You see, we have to exercise our faith and we must apply what Proverbs 3 teaches us. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight this is precisely what joseph did joseph didn't clinch the proverbial steering wheel of his life he said okay god if this is what you have for me i'm gonna do it i'm gonna trust i'm gonna trust look at what happens in verse 24 when joseph woke up from sleep from the dream he did as the angel of the lord commanded him he took his wife he took his wife he took his wife wife come on honey we're going he obeyed he surrendered his will and his plans and his vision for god's greater vision for their life it was in that moment he applied trust in the lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight and let me just say church we too need to trust god just like that you and i this christmas season with the obstacles we will face if it's not right now they're coming just letting you know and whatever that obstacle is you're facing, you're staring at, we need to be sure that we are leaning into God, leaning into his presence, worshiping him through the obstacle and trusting him. We understand that his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. It's got altitude over our circumstance. And so we've got to lean into trust, lean into faith, exercise that. Listen, what we here's something that I've learned a long time ago, that if God has put you in this season he's allowed that thing to happen he will equip you with the resources that you and i need in that moment to get through the obstacle that's what god does routinely he resources his followers with the right tools and the right attitude and the right perspective to get through what you're going through we need to lean in and exercise and trust the lord and acknowledge him god does have a plan listen god has a plan for a hope for you. He's got a hope for you. He's got a future for you. You are his greatest prize and treasure. Why would he leave you out there to figure it all by, out by yourself? He won't. Trust that he has began a good work in you and he will finish that work. I like to say that God does not work off of contingency plans. When an obstacle meets us, we wring our hands, we wipe the sweat from our brow, we get the cotton mouth and sweaty hands, but God doesn't ever do that. God doesn't work in contingencies. God only works in plan A's. This is the plan. And you gotta trust him through it. Just like I do. Just like Joseph did. See, our obstacles are opportunities to worship and to trust. And finally, their opportunities to encourage. If you go back into the story now, another perspective on the very first Christmas is with Mary and Elizabeth as she heads to Elizabeth's part of the region. Look with me in Luke chapter one, in verse 39, the scripture says, in those days, in what days? The pregnant days. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. In the pregnant days, Mary arose and went with haste, that means just quickly, into the hill country. I love the detail of Luke. With haste and in the hill country. She's a pregnant woman. She went quickly and she went as fast as she could and it wasn't an easy trip. How many of y'all know that's true of pregnancy? You wish it was quicker than it was, probably. And there are lots of ups and downs. 
as it is with Mary, to a town of Judah, verse 40, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. Now, we, uh, you know, we need to know this, that, that Mary was from a small town. And if you're from a small town, like Mary was from the one light town, you know what I'm talking about, the one stop light town? That was Nazareth. And everybody knew everybody's business. Everybody knew her story, and you can imagine the looks that she got. You can imagine what people said about her, that she was pregnant when, oh, by this mysterious, oh yeah, God got you pregnant, what a great excuse. Your high schooler comes to you and tells you that, you got another thing coming, okay? Like, I'm telling you right now, that's off for most of us. You can imagine how she felt. Think about the way she traveled to this place in Judah to see Elizabeth. And I just tried to put myself in her brain this week and how she might have thought. Now, I'm not a woman, so bear with me. Some of you ladies might think something else, but this is what I thought that she thought. You know, um, God, I know you called me to this. Like you sent an angel to me, man. I mean, give me a break. But do you see how they're treating me? Do you hear the words that they're saying? And as I'm walking into town to the market, they're, they're just talking and they're just, just chatter everywhere. Man, I, I thought I lost Joseph right there. I, just for a moment, I thought he wasn't even gonna be around and I was gonna have to do this whole thing by myself. And this is, this is just a little weird, God. Like this is just doesn't seem normal. This, is, this doesn't happen like this. And now I feel like I need to go to my, my family to, to get a little bit of respite and a little bit of love and a little bit of care. But what happens when I show up to Elizabeth's house? What's she gonna say? What an unlikely response that Elizabeth gets her, gives her considering what most likely happened in her own town. Look at what happens. Verse 41. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, Mary's here. Guys, Mary just showed up. Mary's here. That's what we're talking about. That's the moment. When she heard that Mary was in the house, the Bible says that the baby leaped within her womb. She was six months pregnant with John the Baptist at this time. The baby leaped within her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a a loud cry, blessed are you among women. Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this? Listen to these words of this person encouraging this young teenage woman. Why is this granted to me, Elizabeth, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby of my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Guys, what encouragement. I I partially believe that one of the reasons that Elizabeth got uh, got, um, uh, pregnant before Mary was for the sole purpose of for them to navigate through a familiar and similar obstacle so that in the midst of that turmoil, in the midst of that season of struggle, that she would seek respite, care, love, and encouragement from her family and that they could walk through something similar together and they could breathe life into each other's circumstances. I mean, why kick somebody when they're down, man? There's no doubt Mary probably felt disappointed because of all the plans that she had had for their lives. We were gonna go plan the wedding. We were picking out paint colors for the house. We were decorating the baby's room and I was thinking about the dress and who was gonna cater and then boom, this pops in. And isn't it like God to always provide what you need when you need it? And God provided for Mary and Elizabeth to encourage her and to speak truth into her circumstance. There is so much power in our encouragement, probably more than what we realize. That our words, the Proverbs tells us, has the power to breathe life and death in the power of the tongue. The story is told of a famous boxer, Jim Braddock, and he was a promising boxer in the, in the 1920s, and he made it to the title fight, and he actually lost the fight, and he broke his hand during this fight. And that scenario was massive to them, and it plummeted his family into deeper poverty, constantly wondering where the next piece and bit of income was going to come, where the next food was going to come, where their clothing would come. They were barely surviving the Great Depression. 
And uh, Braddock was experiencing roadblock after roadblock, setback after setback, obstacle after obstacle. And during this entire time, his best friend, his best friend, Joe Gould, did not stop encouraging him over and over again. One night before a particular fight, they're sitting in a locker room and he's just reminding him of what he's actually accomplished. And then his wife walks in and she gives him the biggest douse of encouragement and it changes his entire demeanor. I want you to notice the power of encouragement in this interaction. Take a look. All right. Yeah. I'll beat that John Henry Lewis. That Brad guy. <laughs> Correct. Who what that Art Lasky punk? James J. Braddock. Correct again. Now, refresh me on this one. Who was it that took that corn griffin and turned him inside out with no questions asked? Who was that? Hmm? I used to think it was me, but now I'm kind of thinking it was you. No, don't you sell yourself short. <laughs> well, at some uh, stage, you think maybe yeah. I do some taping, maybe? <laughs> uh -huh. Ah, why not? Why not? <clears throat> That? All right, let's see. How's that? What? I thought I'd been trying to tell you. Maybe I understand some about having a fight. So you just remember who you are. You're the bulldog of Birkin. And the pride of New Jersey. You're everybody's hope. And you're your kid's hero. And you are the champion of my heart, James J. Beck. Your words matter. And what I know is that every single one of us need an Elizabeth in our lives that speak truth to who we are as people over our circumstances. Every single one of us need to be reminded a time or two that we are what Ephesians says, God's masterpiece. We need to be reminded what 1 Peter tells us, that we are called to be one of his special people. 1 John 3 tells us that we are his children, that we are his beloved, that we are his workmanship, that we are his treasure. And we all need to be reminded a time or two when our circumstances are weighty, the odds are stacked against us, the obstacle is too difficult to get through. We need a wiser person that has gone before us, that has waded through the obstacle and is leveraging their pain to encourage you and encourage me through the greatest obstacle we've ever faced. For some of you, you've walked through some intense moments in your life. And what I want to tell you is do not waste your pain. Leverage what God has brought you through in your life to take a young man like me and say, hey, let me save you some heartache and encourage me through the hard season of my life. Some of you who've walked through difficulties in your marriage, difficulty in your business, and God is, listen, y'all, I know this sounds counterintuitive. That is a gift. And why is it a gift? Because God could use you and leverage your obstacle in the next generation. And here's what I know is many of us need an Elizabeth, but some of us need to be an Elizabeth today and be available to be a light of encouragement into the heart of someone who is facing their obstacle. 
You see, the story of Christmas is surrounded by so many obstacles and so many that we couldn't even literally spend an entire sermon on it because uh, there's so many of them. But you see, these things that we face in our lives, the things that the first family of Christmas experience in their lives, they're, they're not setbacks. They're, they're obstacles, but they're actually opportunities. They're tools that God uses to deepen our relationship with him. And it is often through the obstacles that we face that God shows up the most. And what God wants for you and what God wants for me, what God wants for us is to flip our perspective on our obstacles and to see them as opportunities to worship, to trust, and to encourage one another. You see, we're all going to face them, aren't we? It just matters what you do with what you face. And now we know that God has called us to see these as opportunities to worship, to trust, and to encourage. Join me as we pray. Father, we come to you and we thank you for your word and the power that it holds in our lives. Thank you for the story of Christmas. It makes it so relatable when we hear this from people and what they're walking through. God, speak to us now as we apply this. With every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around, I've got two questions for you. How many of you today would just say, hey, pastor, here's the deal. I I actually am facing an obstacle right now in this moment. And uh, this wasn't necessarily easy for me to hear today, but I'm facing an obstacle and I'd love for you to pray for me. Would you just lift your hand in the air? Nobody's looking around, but you're facing an obstacle. Thank you for your honesty. Raise them up, man. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much. God, be with our family here today. God, we're facing obstacles and God, this is a very real moment where the rubber meets the road and God, you've called us now to to worship through the obstacle. We're calling heaven down right now uh, to meet us in this moment. God, move into action. We surrender to you, God. We we trust your plans. God, we're not gonna lean on our own understanding. We're gonna acknowledge your ways and we're we're gonna let you straighten the path. We're not gonna straighten the path. We're gonna let you do that. And God, if what I'm walking through today and what our family's walking through today in this room, Father, what I would ask is that that you would bring along some folks like you brought Elizabeth along for Mary and that we could encourage one another in our obstacle, God. Leverage what we've walked through and don't waste it. May we invest it into people's lives so that they can rise above and they can be encouraged by the Spirit of God through what we've walked through in our lives. God, thank you for this. Still praying today. There's another group of people that are here today, truth be told. um, Some of us, the greatest obstacle that we might be bumping up into that we're constantly trying to fix in our life is actually what the Bible calls sin. Huge obstacle. I've tried to fix it in my life years ago and it's an obstacle. But uh, here's the thing. God loves you so much that through the story of Christmas, through the birth of Christ, he would send his son to die on the cross for your sin sacrifice his life on the cross for yours and for mine he would take your place he would take my place on a hill called calvary that's what he would do and he would raise from the dead and by putting your faith and trust in him here's the good news your obstacle is obliterated the obstacle is shattered and your sin is taken care of and now if you put your play, your faith and your trust in Christ, you can receive the gift of Jesus into your life and the obstacle of sin is taken care of. If you've never done that today, we want to give you an opportunity to enter into the Christmas season receiving the best present ever and it's Christ in your life. And the way you receive that is simply by believing. And what we ask you to do is to do just confess it now by raising your hand and say, I've never received Christ and today I want to receive him into my life. Would you just raise your hand right now and say, I've never received Christ and today is the moment that I was brought here. I want to receive Christ today. Today I receive Christ. Would there be anybody that would say yes to God in this moment? Father, what we know is that your word does not return void ever. And that only my job here is not to manipulate or to construe anything for someone to make a decision. What we know is that uh, because your word doesn't return void, it's like a plant. And so I, my job is to plant seeds into the souls of men. And God, your spirit will water it. And, and even if it doesn't come to fruition today, I'm trusting and believing that if there's a man or a woman or a student here today who's never put their faith in Christ, that this seed would be watered this week and they would respond in faith to not the baby Jesus, but the risen Christ, and that they would receive him in their lives today. Father, use us this week as vessels, as as instruments um, of worship and of trust, and God, use us to encourage one another this week. God, would you use us to invite folks here to be a part of what you're doing in your church? God, your glory is here. Your presence is real, 
And you, God, we know that, yes, you came, Father, as a little baby, uh, but you are a soon returning, resurrected Savior, King on a white horse to receive us as your church. And God, we long for the day where we get to see Jesus face to face. And Christmas provides that eager expectation in our heart to see our Savior alive and active like we are in this very moment. God, thank you. We worship you. We thank you for who you are and what you've done in this house today. In Christ's name. And everybody said, amen. Why don't you stand and worship with us?